And, and here we are in the last session of uh, State of the Nation 2018. I'm Andrew Stevens, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, host slash chair this, uh, this session on empowering consum consumers in the new economy. And anyone that's sort of uh, noticed me around uh, various things will know that the new economy is something that has been particularly central to my career and my professional interest uh, for quite some time. And so it's an absolute pleasure to uh, be part of this session, and I'll introduce my colleagues uh, on the panel uh, as we get there. But uh, their detailed backgrounds are included in the, uh, the, the conference program, and so I'd encourage you just to refresh yourself with those. Um, in talking about the, the new economy and this digital world that we're in, I just thought it might be useful before we get going to use an example to, and set some context in relation to the scale of impact of the digital economy uh, and allow you to then assess how far advanced you think we really are. And so with great uh, respect uh, for our colleagues from and our members and the participants here from BP and Shell, I'm going to use a uh, fuel economy example just to use it as the baseline for uh, comparison in setting this context. And so if we look at about the time the computer industry really, the digital world really started getting going in about sort of not the early stages of the mainframe in 1963 to 1965, but in about 1980, at the time, if you remember back that the personal computer was quite a standout thing. And I remember working uh, in 1981, when my manager appeared with the first portable personal computer, which was a Compaq, and it looked more like a sewing machine. Now, those of you who remember that machine, that you snapped the bottom off it, and that, in fact, was the keyboard. It was made by Compaq, and it was there, but using that as the baseline. But if we look at fuel economy in, in cars in 1980, then round figures, most people would say that about we had about 30 miles to the gallon in those days, uh, which, which translates to about, uh, sorry, a little bit less than 30, about 25 miles to the gallon, it translates to 37 kilometres on four litres of petrol. And if we look at where automotive development and fuel development has got us to today, then the reality is in 2018, there's been about a 10% improvement over that period in fuel economy through engine technology and fuel technology and lighter vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. A 10% increase, which in the past we would say over a 38-year period was sort of, I think, okay. I'm just gonna give you some examples, some calculations that explain the development that's happening in computing power. And it was Gordon Moore, who was one of the co-founders of Intel, created what became to be known as Moore's Law. And Moore's Law uh, was actually about the density of integrated circuits or transistors on chips, but it came to be used as a proxy for computing power, which ended up as the same thing, and computing cost. And if we applied Moore's Law, basically it says that computing power or density on chips and computing power doubled every one to two years, and the cost of providing it halved over the same period. So there's a factor of potentially four over every one and a half to two year period. Gordon Moore himself said about uh, in the late 80s, he thought that the law was no longer, was at risk of not applying. But then he said five years later, actually it's gone on uh, unabated and it continues today. And so if we start with that same uh, four litres of petrol to travel, uh, 37 kilometres, uh, and we said apply that to Moore's law so we get a proxy for what's happening in computing. By 1994, we should have been able to travel from Sydney to Perth on four litres of fuel. By 2002, we would be able to drive from Sydney to Sydney, in other words, around the world on four litres of fuel. By 2009, we would have been able to travel to the moon on four litres of fuel, and by 2026, we'd be able to travel to the sun on four litres of fuel. Such is the power 
of, com of the computing world. And where we're heading to in this digital economy is we're seeing here, and I was just in the US and went to Singularity University for a day. Basically, they talk in Singularity University about the abundance that will come from this infinite, infinite digital power that is on our doorstep. It's on our doorstep. I won't ask you to, uh, cons uh, to, uh, to put your hand up, but you can consider where you think we are in, as a nation, as our business, as our uh, agencies, as our government, how far advanced we are in the use of that power that's there. I would say, my assessment is, we are as a baby learns to turn from its back to its tummy before it gets up on its knees, we're at about at that point. It's very, very early. When we also think and we talk and worry about artificial intelligence and machine learning, one of the things I learnt when I was in uh, Silicon Valley was Facebook have 78 engineers working on telepathy which basically is not what we're actually doing, but what we're thinking about. And with all sorts of skull caps and all sorts of other technologies they're exploring, they have 78 engineers completely dedicated to, tech, to telepathy and what's happening. So the, the scenario really here is that whether we are prepared for it or not, my contention is that digital will overpower analog and physical in every respect, and in particular, that digital business models will overpower physical business models. And we've seen there are some industries where this is underway and quite having quite disruptive impact, uh, and we're having other we see other industries where there's very very little. So I'm just trying to set up the environment here for this thing about empowering the com the consumer in this new world. One of the things that worries me as a director of CEDA that we don't have any organisations that are making any material progress in being like the fangs of the US. And by fangs, you, you would know that when I'm talking about Facebook, uh, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google, Google and Apple. We don't have companies that are really well advanced and at scale in developing the business models that will capitalise on this infinite and abundant capability that, quite frankly, is the greatest opportunity the world has ever seen. In terms of empowering consumers then, just to set up this discussion, the question is, is our setting and is our mindset that this is a threat or this is an opportunity or possibly is it both? Is it the greatest opportunity we've ever had? Is it the greatest threat we've ever faced or is it a little bit of each. And to discuss this with us today, we have three panel members. We have one who develops services and products for her customers and for competitive gain and uh, in their sector, Amanda Hagen, who is the Chief Customer Officer and Group Executive Digital at Australian Unity. We have one who regulates and enforces for consumer and com competition protection, Delia Rickard, who's the Deputy Chair of the ACCC. And we also have one who advocates for the consumer, especially where regulation or corporate practice compromises vulnerable customers. And that's Jared Brody, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Consumer Action Law Centre. And so with my introduction and context, we've got, I think you'll agree, very different perspectives amongst our panellists to really look at this point uh, about empowering consumers and this central point about opportunity or threat. Amanda, I'm going to start with you as I join you over on the panel there. And we're, I'm just interested in exploring the state of readiness in your sector. How uh, open, how available, uh, what are the possibilities uh, in terms of data availability to improve health outcomes, cost, convenience and overall experience for consumers? Where are we and where could we be? Thanks, Andrew. It's an interesting question from a healthcare perspective because, in my opinion anyway, it's not the digital processing power that's holding us back in healthcare. The good news, I guess, is that there is enormous opportunity and I believe it will be digital and data that are going to empower consumers 
and that that will be how we're going to look at starting to improve outcomes and reduce cost in the healthcare system by empowering consumers to make these decisions with, with their healthcare providers. I think unlike most other industries, um, there are basic elements that make up an efficient marketplace that are missing in the healthcare sector, and they're primarily price discovery and understanding what the value is that you're getting for that price or what you're outlaying, and in health that means outcomes. So to have empowered consumers, we need to have both of these to make that happen. Um, so what, maybe I'll just paint you a picture of where both of these exist and you might be able to see how both quality and cost could come down in the system and it is data and digital that's going to get us there. So picture that you've got um, some pain in your hip, you've had it for a long time, you've been putting off the inevitable for as long as you can, um, you've decided with your GP that you, it is time to go get something done so you need a referral to a specialist, um, you sit down, your, your GP is able to tell you all of the specialists that can do a hip replacement for you, what outcomes they get, what the out-of-pocket is going to be, um, also what prostheses you're going to be looking at getting, um, and the volume, how many of is, are these specialists doing of this operation each year. Um, you then make an informed decision. You also know what the anaesthetist is going to charge as well, by the way. You can make an informed decision together based on the price and the quality or the outcome that it's not perfect, perfect, but likely outcome of, of having that done. Your health fund is informed because they're digitally connected to your GP, and so they, they ring your specialist and talk about having rehab at home, so you can get out of home as fast as you can um, using remote monitoring via an internet of things enabled device on your hip to help with your um, rehab. Your health fund has an app that provides you with information on what questions to ask your specialists about what likely outcomes are going to be, and again, importantly, what prostheses they're planning on, what joint they're going to put into your hip. So when you go to the specialist, you're armed with, with those questions, you ask them, go through those, and turns out that specialist is not planning on using a joint that is the top three performing. Um, we happen to have a registry that has 15 years of data of every joint that's been put into somebody's body in this country. Um, so you suggest, well, maybe I'd like to use one of those top three performing ones instead of the one that you're going to use. You know instantly from your health fund there's no out-of-pocket associated with that. You go home, you just want a, a second opinion on all this, so you release the information from your e-health record that contains all of your history to a service that gets a second opinion from a specialist anywhere in the world. Luckily, it comes back and says you do need, that, that, that's not going to be a contest here, you do need your hip replaced. Um, that surgery goes according to plan. You've had the best, you think, information to make that decision. You get out of hospital really soon, go home. Your health fund funds that to have rehab in the home with a re remote monitoring device that, that tailors the, the exercises to your, what you need and what you're doing. So all of this combined dramatically reduces the cost of having this done because you've spent the minimal amount of time in hospital. You've used a joint that performs the best, so you've got much less chance of having to have this surgery redone and minimal amount of time spent in hospital. So today, actually, no, there's nothing holding us back from... Well, not nothing. There's a lot of incentives in the system. The technology is not what's holding us back here. Um, in fact, Australian Unity has been doing rehab in the home for nearly 10 years, and we do it at a third of the cost of what that costs in a hospital. Um, and we've just partnered with Deakin to look at remote monitoring and Internet of Things device for your hip. So it's all possible. But what's considered normal in the space of, like, retail is not considered normal in healthcare. So I think that's what we need to start working on. The computing so, power is not holding us back. So, no, no, not at all, not at all. Delia, just given the ACCC mandate to promote competition and fair trade in markets to benefit consumers, businesses and the community, what's your view, what are your views in relation to this opportunity or threat continuum and where are we? Look, I think it's a bit of both, to be absolutely honest. And just before I talk about what I want to talk about, I have to say, Amanda, that sounds like Nirvana. Sounds we great, released our annual report on the private health insurance sector yesterday, and we are so far from consumers being able to make informed decisions about quality or price. Um, it has to get better. So I enjoyed listening to that. Um, look, data, new technology, consumers... I think it presents some absolutely fantastic opportunities, and particularly when you combine it with consumer data right. 
That's a reform that's going through now. The ACCC is leading that, working with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and um, a group called Data61, which will enable consumers to access their data in a safe way and then feed it into a credited, an accredited comparison service. And these comparison services, when you think about it these days, we spend a much larger proportion of the money we have on services than we ever used to. We spend it on banking, we spend it on energy, we spend it on telecommunications. And there are a multiplicity of players in each of these sectors. There are goodness knows how many products. And it is almost impossible for the average person to compare those products and offerings to get the right deal. And I think comparison services, and by not because they're so complex and people often don't get the right deal, they're not sending the right signals to ensure a really competitive market, we call it a confusopoly, and consumers are just <laughs> not benefiting. Um, so I think these comparison services, combined with um, the access to data, being able to be fed into them, if done properly, and I think that's a big if, because you need to ensure, then it really has the potential to deliver enormous benefits to consumers. But I think there are, and I actually put those benefits up there. I used to say the introduction of intra industry ombudsman was probably the best things that happened to consumer protection in the last few decades. And I think this has the potential to rival it. But it is about getting it right. And there's a couple of things I think which are involved there. Um, one is ensuring that the system works. And I think one of the biggest problems we have on the consumer protection side around new technology is the black box. The, el in, the invisibility of those algorithms. As a regulator tr in traditional economy, it's fairly easy to see when someone's been misled, when it's been unconscionable conduct, all of those things. We don't know, though, in a lot of times, how the algorithms are working. Are they really telling people what's the best deal, the cheapest deal, or have they been tweaked um, so that the offer of the comparison service is going to get the best commission rate. And we know this sort of thing goes on. So we need, to be able, we need to be able to ensure the integrity of the services that we feed the data into. And then I think there's also a big piece on the behavioural side with consumers, how we give them the confidence to use this, these really great tools. And I think we're seeing an evolution in those comparison tools now. Up until now, there's been a service, they probably don't cover the whole market, um, and they'll, tell, they'll, they'll usually tell you a better thing than you're on, but that's about all that you can often expect. We're seeing a new generation here. I think it started in the UK with a service called the Flipper Service, which enabled people to put in their energy data, and it would search the market, and, and they paid, but only if they got a saving, I think, of £99. Um, so there was no conflicts behind it, and they would search the market with informed consent, move you on to the best best offer for you, and then every couple of months do it again, which kept people on the best deal. You'd have to be careful, of course, that industry then didn't put on place big exit fees and other things to stop it. So I think there's huge, huge potential from technology, but I think we've got to sort of think through where the pitfalls are and be addressing those at the same time as rolling out. I did want to talk about one negative, though, um, and this is a hobby horse of mine because it's one of those unsexy topics that people don't pay a lot of attention to. You know what's coming, Jared, which is scams. And as a nation, we know of at least 340 million lost last year to personal scams. My educated guess is that's about 10%. And most of those scammers access their, their victims via modern technology, whether it's through VoIP-operated calls, whether it's through social media these days, whether it's via the internet or email. And I think we've just got to get smarter and better. And I think there's a real role for telcos in this sector. The banks are starting to do some quite good work to be really looking at how we stop that tsunami of calls coming in and how we really start to protect people a bit better in that space. Fantastic. Just while you're on there, before we go to Jared, is I'm just interested in, um, we see these very large, highly valuable, powerful businesses who have really gone deep into this digital business model. And it seems to me that one of the challenges, we don't have enough of them, so there's no competition between them. 
and therefore we haven't got the market checks and balances and therefore we're relying on regulators to try and protect. Is that sustainable, do you think, or, or will that evolve over time, do you believe? Um, look, I think it's a very interesting question. It's obviously a question that we're looking at in our digital platforms inquiry at the moment. And I think it's a really difficult area because these are mostly two-sided markets. So if you take most of the platforms, the more users they attract, um, then the more advertisers they get. The advertisers want to be where the users are, the users want to be where other users are. Um, so it, it is one of the big conundrums facing thing, us all at yeah, the, 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 the power of them is also the potential threat or weakness of them as yeah. well. Gerard, just over to you then, in terms of the Consumer Action Law Centre, and I'll just read a, a quote, you know, is, try, is all about a just marketplace where people have power and business plays fair. What are the, some of the markets that you see where there's potential for risk, threat, and potential for opportunity? Um, well, I, I must say that I agree there is a lot of opportunities um, in technology to bring services that are valued to consumers and, and meet their needs, but there are risks as well. And just maybe if I, I um, build on Amanda's description of the health sector, and we saw media over the weekend about a startup called Health NG, uh, which purported to fill a, a, a really helpful need for consumers and, and health professionals in booking appointments. Um, but uh, at least alleged in the media, um, un unbeknownst to people that use that service, it was also um, ga gaining, of course, your personal information as part of that, and then on selling that to um, uh, lawyers who would then um, potentially find new clients that, to, to may may maybe make insurance claims and so forth. Um, so I think that uh, uh, we really have to look about the, ha uh, uh, the use of information that's gained by um, uh, 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 businesses and also um, uh, the, the likely outcome. So we at Consumer Action did release a short report earlier this year looking at um, an industry called lead generation. So it's probably not a, a new industry. It's been there for a long time in the marketing sector. But what we looked at was how it's, I guess, uh, um, grown and changed in the online sector. And, and there is now a, a large and growing industry of uh, businesses that are collecting a lot of people's information and details online. It might be through surveys. It might be through competitions. And then selling them to marketing companies who will then make unsolicited approaches, and sometimes using very um, high pressure um, in, in um, unsolicited selling. Um, it might be visiting them door to door, it might be visiting them on the phone, um, and, and the complaints that then, then turn to our centre is that people have been signed up to services or products that, that are ill-suited or they can't afford. Um, so I do think we need to look across, um, uh, you know, and, and put in protections in place as these markets grow. The other area that I think that's really worth watching is the way in which data can be used um, to price um, products and services. Um, and previously, I think price was more or less a function of a product, how much it costs to make, um, and so forth. Increasingly today, we're seeing price being a function of the consumer, how much they're willing to pay um, based on uh, a lot of detail and data that, abyss, that the industry holds about the customer. So we see price discrimination. Now, price discrimination is not always bad. I think we're all used to it in areas like airlines where we pay um, cheaper prices to book at an inconvenient time or um, ahead of time. But there are now ways which, um, you know, you don't see that transparency about someone else being charged a higher price than me um, uh, because it's all online and, and it, that's not visible to you. And we see that in um, some of the complex uh, service markets like energy, like telecommunications, where uh, the businesses are able to distinguish between the type of customer who is likely to shop around, who they'll give a really good price to, and those that um, don't or are loyal to their service provider, who over time will su suffer an increased price. Um, so I really think when we, particularly in those markets that are about essential service, we have to think about fairness in that. Surely a market should be delivering the best prices for all consumers, um, not only those that are, are capable or, or willing to shop around. Just while you're on that point, Jared, I just want to link then to Delia's point and bringing in the uh, consumer data right, and as the chair of the data standards body working with the ACCC and OAIC, on that point, one of the things we've started to do is look at use cases in relation to 
uh, what consumers will choose to do uh, to, with their, their data. And one of the key use cases that comes up is risk-based pricing mm. on lending, which would mean that some customers who are a lower risk would attract lower pricing in terms of interest rates than those would be high. So where do you see, where's the, where's the uh, your law centre mm -hmm. on that view, on that point, given your point you just raised on fairness? Well, I think that we must look at it with a fairness overlay. I mean, already in our credit markets, um, some people are charged higher amounts than others due to um, their, their credit reports or other um, uh, reasons. Um, but I think that with the... Um, move to much more, there's a move at the moment to mandatory credit reporting uh, that, and much more comprehensive information on your credit report. There's actually a, a bill that's been debated this week in federal parliament on this issue, um, which will mean that every single um, uh, repayment that you make, it will be recorded whether you paid on time or not. Um, so that gives a wealth of new data to, to um, industry, and you're right, we, we look overseas and we see how uh, other countries are using that data, and you see credit cards offered in the UK and the US that are charging 50% per annum. Um, so I think that we also, uh, I think there are problems with that because they're likely to be ch uh, targeted to people that have the less capacity to afford them, and so they're, they're going to be charged more. Um, and, and we need to um, uh, really be, be recognising, well, what are the limits uh, of, of these sort of arrangements? Where should there be some intervention to ensure that um, people aren't being exploited but, but the, the, the markets are fair? I guess in credit it can be difficult because competition may not be worth working to keep prices down because people feel like they're, they're desperate for the money. They'll, yeah. they'll accept it at any price. I, so I think that's the point, isn't it? That, that if we allow the market to run in the full, at its full efficiency, then there will be some people who won't be able to afford the products who could either uh, going to be exploited or they can't have access. And the question is, is there a role in terms of regulation? I'm going to come to you in a second, Amanda, about a, a question on this. Is where are, where, what's right in this new world but we've, my, my hypothesis is we need to be much deeper into this in thinking of it. Mm. We know we're near far enough advanced in it and the level of questions and, to quote speakers from yesterday, the mature discussion about these points is nowhere near where I think it should be. Uh, it's just my personal view in relation to this because these are really, really serious issues. Jeff Connolly was talking about Industry 4.0 and you think about leveraging in the wider economy the digital power in the I4.0 scenario and you see where Australia is versus where we probably could be. As a differentiator as a nation in the competitive world we're in, if we were 10%, 100% further down the track than where we are, would we be in better shape? I think we'd be in better shape. I think we'd be in better shape. Amanda, just coming to you, what are the, some of the things that government, regulators, even consumers can do to basically prepare for this? And folks, I'm going to come to you next for questions, please, so get those at the ready uh, if you can. What, what are the things that we need, what are the preconditions and things we need to put in place to get, uh, get things moving here? Yeah, again, coming back to healthcare, there's a few things we need to do. I think health funds need to come together in a far more meaningful way to work on transparency. I think it's, we're still a bit in the, are we competitors when it comes to transparency for consumers or are we working together? Um, I think the incentives in the system need to look at um, paying for outcomes versus paying for activity. Privacy is a really big one and privacy of consumer data has to be a given. Consumers will not participate in, in any system that, where these things are happening, where the, where the data is being passed on for other uses. But I think we also, we have to look at privacy of providers. So at the moment, that is always put up as a barrier in healthcare as to why we can't provide transparency to consumers. And if I look at, go back again to the Joint Registry, because it's a really great source of data. Um, you know, in FY15, this is not my data, this is from Professor Stephen Graves from the Joint Registry, there was $300 million paid for joints that should never have been used in this country. So the, the, the privacy of providers is somehow put before the, what, you know, the protection of consumers in that regard. So I think we do need to open up that, that Pandora's box um, because I don't think you should be paying through your premiums for things that have to be redone and where harm's been caused. Um, now, we need more of that data as well. It's not perfect. That's not collected for everything that we do in the healthcare system. Um, but I think also in terms of, um, bit to Delia's point, in designing things, we have to put 
better, more thought into designing around involving the clinicians and the, the consumers in how we go about developing these things because so many things get launched out there in the digital community that are never used. They may have actually been great ideas yeah. and a lot of a massive amounts of capital are going into this in the US and all over the world. But a lot of them fail because we just didn't design them properly around consumers and the clinicians as to what outcome. And then we're not scaling them properly either. We're investing a lot of money in startup, but not in crossing that chasm from startup to scale up in, in healthcare at least. Exactly. Delia, just in terms of the consumer data right and open banking as the first cab off the rank, the ACCC's role as the rule setter in this case, to me as someone who's involved, is interesting because it seems that the regulator enforcer has now re been required to write the rules. Is that a challenge for ACCC? Um, I think we're in a good position to write the rules because I think we will write them in a way. I, I mean, it's a new area and yeah. it will be interesting. So as a new, new function, there's no doubt about that. But I think that what's being said by giving us that role is we want this data right, as well as protecting privacy, and there's definitely a very big role in there for the information commissioner, but we want it to drive competition and we want it to drive consumer benefits. And I think that our perspective as a regulator, and in regulating the various sectors that will come under this, um, gives us a very good overview of what will help drive competition and consumer benefits and where the dangers are. Because they say where you sit is where you stand and we spend our life looking at what people do wrong, what organisations do wrong as a right more than what they do right. So I think that that gives us a fairly realistic perspective of not just what consumers need but what we need to guard against. And just as a use case <laughs> example, in a deposit account, you as the consumer could direct your bank to say, make available your data to a company, a fintech that does budgeting support, to say, please make my transactional data available so that they can then populate their models to show me what a budget might be, for example. So the whole concept of access, transfer, use, informed consent. In the UK, it came up yesterday, this thing about informed consent. The model that fortunately ACCC and the data standards body and the Information Commissioner are not starting with an entirely blank sheet, we're starting with the UK experience. And in the UK, they have an informed consent that has to be refreshed every 90 days that says, I make my data available, and in 90 days there's a, a, a prompt back that says, are you still comfortable that that's it, and you have to opt in yet again. But that, that's what we're talking about, and so I'm just interested whether, Jared, you think that most organisations think that data is the customer's, or it's theirs which needs to be protected and held onto very tightly, and then we're coming to questions. I don't think most people know about their data, to be honest, so this will be a revelation to them that it might be something they can access and, and to help them. Um, and really the data right, as I see it, it's about um, creating new opportunities for, um, for intermediaries to, to facilitate outcomes for people that suits them. So the example that you just provided about a, a budgeting service is one really good example, I think, that could provide a service that really helps people. I mean, since we've had um, online banking for some years and, and so forth, but that we, we haven't actually had our passbooks anymore to see what transactions we had, so it was hard to know exactly how you were going with your finances. But now we've moved to a point where it's going to be much more transparent and easier for customers, and I think that's where the opportunity for industry is to help, to help people. And I, I, I must say that I think there's... Um, I, I'm really pleased to see the ACCC have the role in uh, setting rules um, because I think they are well placed to um, balance both the, the consumer benefit and, and the competition issues. Um, but I think in addition to that, we must think about um, what other institutions are necessary, and I know there's some thought being put into this, about if there is, is an issue that comes up, resolving a dispute is very simple and easy. Um, uh, the, the worst thing for customers is if you know that somebody has misused their data, and that, that, that it's not just the, the financial impact that might have, but the time and effort to do something about it, leading, leaving them with distrust. And the other institution I would say that's necessary, maybe this is a, a bit of a, a self-interested one, is that we do need um, uh, consumer advocacy um, to be brought to the table in these decisions to sort of counter. Um, the industry voices, which are much better resourced to participate to some of the decision-making that's going to affect consumers. 
Excellent. Now, questions of this amazing panel. Oh, there's hands everywhere. Right, let's start down here with Megan, if we can. Down, in the, down on the front, Sharon, on your side here. Can someone get a microphone down to, to Megan, please? Megan Motto from Consult Australia. I wanted to ask a question about uh, regulation. I'll start with a very a brief context, and that is I was speaking to Professor Ian Harper when he was doing the competition policy review. We were talking about Uber in the very early days of Uber before it was regulated. And he said to me, of course, you know, the problem with Uber is it's not regulated. And I said, well, I, I would suggest to you that maybe it is regulated. It's, it's uh, regulated in real time by the power of the people. It's just a different format of regulation that regulators aren't used to, lead, lead time regulation as opposed to lag regulation. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, it, it strikes me that we talk a lot about how the regulators will respond to sectors that are disrupted through technology, but regulation itself is prime for disruption through technology. And I wonder what thoughts in all of your sectors that you've been giving to how regulation itself might be disrupted by technology, how it can be done so, so that we are making more consumer-centric regulation as opposed to heavily front-end loaded or back-end loaded regulation. And what incentives or what you think will be the challenges and drivers to make that a reality for us? That sounds like a multi-part question. Uh, Delia, would you like to have a first go at that oh, one? That's a great question. Um, look, I think it is a real challenge, and it's something that regulators are thinking about. And I'll put it in the context of the sharing economy. And one of the main ways that it, if you like, regulates itself is the whole use of reviews, user reviews and supplier reviews. Now, what we've become aware of, in our boring old traditional regulatory hat, though, is some of the issues there. You get a whole series of fake online reviews, um, and you also get a whole, uh, it's interesting, you just talk to anyone about their review of their Uber driver or whatever, and even if they had a shocking service, they don't want to write it because in case the Uber driver then writes something bad about them and they won't have to be able to get a car next time. It doesn't but, stop me. Um, and you can, there's a gazillion stories like that. But it's one of the things consumer protection regulators around the world, it's like one of the few times we've all been able to agree on something and get, get somewhere internationally, is I think there's a real onus on the sharing economy, in particular in this example, to self-police to a much better degree that it does. So to have mechanisms in place to identify fake reviews, and there's a whole range of ways you can usually do that and keep them off. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a raft of things around that. And I think that the more they do that, the more at least consumer protection style regulators will stay out of their hair. There's whole other issues around employment law and all those sorts of things. Um, so the extent to which new technology is left to regulate itself, I think will be dependent upon them. And the extent to which they identify the, the problems, that are, the potential for problems to arise and address them. and where they do, I suspect governments will stand back because it's quite difficult regulating these multinational beasts. Um, and to the extent they don't, I think they'll find themselves subject to traditional regulation. And this is my point about if there's more of the businesses that are playing in this way, there will be greater market, competition and market forces in place. And also, I, I, I think it's going to put into context, the right context, the, the need for regulation in that world, because I think there's a transition here. The regulation today might be different to what it needs to be in, in the fullness of time, whatever that is. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, Yasmin King from Skills IQ. My question's to Amanda. You gave a great example about how we can save money by... by uh, dealing with the information asymmetry for consumers in the medical system, keeping them out of hospital. What if we take that one step further? What about from population health outcomes, actually the preventative use of information um, to improve population health before they even get sick? Yeah, it's a great question. And unfortunately, we just continue to invest always at the point of disaster or the, the acute care. And I think I haven't looked at the stats in the last 12 months, but we used to do 1.8% of healthcare expenditure on prevention, most of which was immunisation. 
So investment in non-immunisation is minimal. Now, it's not to say corporates and other um, sector participants aren't investing in it, but I also think consumers are going to be empowered by data. You know, a lot of us have got our Apple Watches where data is being collected on a mass scale that has never been seen before, and the sophistication of these devices is mind-blowing. So I think um, it may happen, I guess, by stealth or by technology-enabled companies putting that into the hands of the consumer and then being able to proactively do something before, but, or as your, as your risks are going up, to be able to actually self-manage rather than relying on the healthcare system to have to do it for you. Because I can't see us in the near future directing from acute care into prevention. I just, I can't see it happening. More questions? Yes. Rowan. Um, uh, Andrew, um, uh, Rowan Mead from Australian Unity. Could I just take this point of um, the data right uh, a bit forward um, and, and ask you and perhaps Delia and, and perhaps Jerry to speculate a little bit. Um, if consumers, um, you know, along the lines of perhaps some of uh, Amanda's examples, start to assert their rights and their interests in these uh, arenas, and they come up against non-traditional players that have never been subject to consumer interest forces before. Uh, so you, you made an example there of uh, directing a bank to send um, my particular uh, budgetary information to a fintech that might help me. Now, that's a relationship that has been governed and somewhat evolved by an understanding of regulation and a position of consumer and, and, and so on in a set of... Uh, transactions. There's a whole raft of um, uh, interactions with other sectors of the economy, particularly the, the non-markets economy within government and so on, where this type of data request, data uh, right assertion could become very interesting. And if I think a little bit about healthcare, um, you know, what happens the first time for you, for Delia, for, for others, when people start asserting their rights uh, regarding clinical specialists? regarding craft groups and their capacity to have information, for example, on the success rates of surgeons collectively. The um, medical indemnity insurers, records of the failure rates of surgeons, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we can start speculating in these areas and we get into some very interesting territory very fast. I'd be interested in your reflections on where this might go and how hot a seat are you going to be sitting in soon? To start on, um, uh, we talked touched before on, I guess, new tools that regulators need to bring to bear in, in these new markets, and I think you've, you've picked on one there about um, uh, really shining a light on outcomes, whether that's, um, you know, it might be insurance claims ratios or it could be, um, as you talked, um, the outcomes of, of particular providers. One example that I like to see us at least do more in Australia is um, publish complaints. Um, the New South Wales Office of Fair Trading is the only consumer protection regulator that I'm aware of that publishes um, a, a list of the top complainants um, that are made um, to it each month. Now, the beauty of that is that no business wants to be on that top 20. So they invest in um, fixing their processes, make sure that they're not on it next month. Um, and I think there's much to be gained in, in um, just using information uh, much more powerfully to create the right incentives inside businesses to resolve customer issues and prevent them to begin with. And I'd like to see the HCC publish complaints and the ASIC publish complaints to have that impact, um, uh, and the health regulators to publish complaints to have that impact more broadly across um, different markets. Look, I, I agree with you. There's just a raft of issues in there. And whilst personally I think it offers huge potential for consumers, I can see, for instance, on the competition side, it's a real barrier to entry to new players in, if we take the health field. Um, if you're just starting out as an orthopaedic surgeon and you haven't done too many hips yet, you know, how do you get your clients, even if you're a terrific person? So I think there's a lot we have to think through on it. I don't have all the answers right now, but yeah, yeah, it's not simple. Uh, just to, Rowan, it's exactly a great point, and we've looked at this because if we, you listen to Alistair McGibbon yesterday and he gave the example of uh, fintechs being able to meet the cyber security thresholds to be able to play in these environments, 
he could have been talking about some of the scenarios that we've already started to work at, work with, with the folks from Data 61. Because if, if the standards are uh, at a level where no fintechs can provide the service and therefore no one can be accredited by the ACCC to be a recipient, it, which is how the, 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 the rules will manifest by there, and ACCC will operate the registry by which uh, those accredited recipients can register and then receive, then it's going to be a pretty hollow regime if no one other than the three or four existing players can um, meet the standards to do it. And so this is, I don't think, something that's going to be set on the 1st of July 19, which is when the initial transactions relating to data held by the four established banks will be made available in three uh, quite narrow categories uh, will be the end result. It will be, in my view, and this is to be determined, but this will be the starting point, uh, it will not be the end. Interestingly, on your point, in the banking example, we received a call, or Data61 did, who are the advisor to the data standards body, received a call from the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank said, oh, uh, we've just realised that as an ADI, because we provide the banking facilities and accounts for the federal government, the ATO, etc., uh, that actually uh, our data may well, and our, we may fall uh, under this regime. And the answer is yes, you may. And their concern was, could it be that the uh, data that we do linking to Nicholas's presentation about all of our scenarios and modelling and forecasts economically could then be uh, made available somewhere else. And the question, well, there's numerous answers to that. One is the so-called uh, consumer or the owner of the data would have to consent, and B, the data standards would have to, in scope, cover that sort of data, which, uh, boy, if that ever gets to the, the regime, uh, I think, I doubt I'll be involved and uh, will be in a numerous generations in the future. But the scenarios you talk about are, I think, all of those, which is why you've used them, are all very relevant to consumer rights of saying, am I dealing with an orthopaedic surgeon that I can trust? And is there a history of this orthopaedic surgeon or this joint or this procedure or this uh, anaesthetist that is something that... And, and today, the information on that is very, very poor, virtually non-existent. So it's something we're bearing in mind, but... Once you start to think like this and you open up the possibilities, that's where I've got myself to say, you know what, we are not even crawling in this area. We need to really start thinking and exploring these use cases and what the implications are, and we've got to look at both threats and opportunities. Melinda. Melinda Salento from CEDA. Um, a quick comment first just on that. Um, uh, I was actually involved in a previous life uh, in writing the Productivity Commission report on data access, and so I've got some familiarity with what the intentions were in some of these things, including the, the consumer or comprehensive right. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out, because one of the really strong drivers around this was to actually make sure that as data becomes uh, more and more valuable as an asset to businesses, that it doesn't in fact become a barrier to competition. Uh, so ensuring that consumers can can use their data to actually enable competition that supports them is really important. So it's important that the way we set this up doesn't actually become a barrier in itself uh, to to new businesses. Um, but on a on a different point, and to your point, Andrew, around where we are in this whole process, I'm very mindful of the fact that we use this term data, um, and we know what it means. But there is a whole audience outside of this conference and you know, out in the wider community that probably doesn't even know what we mean when we use the word. Um, and so the example given around, yes, get your information from the bank so that you can have new services and all the rest of it, um, is an important one. And I'm, I'm interested in what people's views are in how we're going to increase data literacy. And I was thinking about it as you were talking, Jared, around the credit card example because we all know that there's been this huge effort around financial literacy. We can talk about health literacy as well, but there is a huge challenge here in terms of data literacy and there are some really strong parallels about, you know, you desperately need your credit so you sign up for something. We all know that we desperately need our latest app and we all tick the terms and conditions on that um, irrespective <laughs> of what it says around privacy. So I think there's a really strong 
issue there around how we're going to deal with that side of it. And I'm interested in the panel's views on that. Um, I don't know if I have the answers to that, Melinda. It's a really difficult challenge, but we can probably learn a little bit from um, where financial literacy initiatives have had impact. Um, and I think it's the lessons are that you can't just um, you know, put out education materials and think people are going to read them um, and engage with them. It's about when they need information um, or, or when they need to make a particular transaction, that's the opportunity to have a discussion with the consumer about, well, uh, you might have rights here, um, uh, here are the other available options for you to, to use to access data and, and access new and different services. Um, but just, I, I think, you know, putting lots of information on websites or um, having, you know, community workshops on the issue, I don't think that's going to cut through to really help people understand what, what we're talking about here. Um, uh, so I, I also think that in addition to, um, you know, uh, data literacy, we also need to think about um, you know, uh, around the, the settings around, you know, sa safety of the system. Um, so people um, can't make really bad choices, I guess, um, that there are some, uh, you know, choice architecture that's brought to bear um, where, uh, you know, that they're guided into decisions that advance their interests um, uh, rather than leaving all the risk onto the, onto the consumer's shoulders. I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. Having background in financial literacy, it's a really interesting one to think about. And I'll just put forward a couple of suggestions. I think, first of all, we've got to get rid of these 800-page privacy statements or statements that take three days, literally, to read your way through. In Europe, we're starting to see some quite nifty little um, two-minute videos that have the key points, and we need to be doing something like that because you're right, people want information at the time, but it's critical to them. But the time that's critical in a lot of today's world is the time you're getting that app, et cetera. And then I think we need to, to really think of the innovative ways to drive home the data that's collected on you. We did a lot of work, I was involved in a lot of work a few years ago getting financial literacy taught in schools. And that is one of those sort of teachable times. And if I was a teacher in school these days, I would make every kid, you can actually go to Google and download your every bit of data they have on you, which is every website you've visited, every search term you've put in, etc. I think, you know, we all did it if the paperwork would fill this room. Um, but get kids to do that and bring it to class. And, you know, we have a discussion around that and who might be able to use that data and what could they do with that data. And, and then encouraging them to go home and talk about it with their grandparents and their families and, and get that intergenerational thing happening. So I think there's a huge amount we need to be doing here. And I think we need to be really bringing it. I think schools are doing a bit of it now. Actually, they're quite aware of it because quite a bit of danger, damage happens with your kids and social media. But we need to think of all those teachable moments. Yeah. And I might just back that up in terms of we've done a lot of work in we do home care for very vulnerable populations and just even comprehending their bill of what arrives in their door, of what services they've got and what they've got to pay for older vulnerable populations is really difficult for people to comprehend. And we, ha we don't generally approach these things as corporates to design it from the customer's perspective and really deeply understand you know, how they live their lives, how they make decisions, what they understand, then how you design something in response to that and making things simple, you know, instead of 300 pages, what are the three key things you need to know about that? But I will say in health, in terms of literacy, much more to be done on right time, right place, but there's also people don't necessarily do anything about it. You've got to be motivated to use the information. First, you've got to be literate on what it, what, what it means for you, certain behaviours, for example, but to motivate people to actually change is a whole nother a whole nother topic. Can I just, just add to that on literacy? Oh, oh sorry, Delia. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we can't underestimate the lack of literacy in the community. Um, the ABS statistics on document literacy, for example, suggest that 40% of Australians can't fill in a basic forms correctly. 40%. Um, so I, I think that we've got to think of other mechanisms as well, in addition to these efforts around improving literacy to ensure that people aren't taken advantage of. 
I'll just make one very last quick point on this one. Um, the last point Amanda made about using it. One of the things that's happened in the financial literacy space is that term is, is slowly being dropped and talking about financial capability because it's about having the knowledge and the behaviours and attitudes. And I think if we're starting afresh, well, we're not quite starting from scratch on digital literacy, but we're, as you say it, just rolling over onto yeah. our backs or tummies or oh, whatever. Um, then I think we should be talking about digital capability or whatever term resonates with people so that it's more than knowledge, it's actually acting on that knowledge. Uh, just to uh, finish on a, that question, uh, which is a great one, uh, Melinda, on a positive, the initial implementation under open banking, uh, which is the first roll out of the consumer data right, is in relation to deposit accounts, transactional accounts, and credit, account, uh, credit accounts not including mortgages. And so it's at the simpler end, I think, but what people will, uh, companies, fintechs, and even existing players will choose to offer based on the data that's included in those accounts, I think will, I'm hoping, will surprise us, given the potential consumer impact of those. But it's, we're starting small, and even in those, if you look at the dimensions here that we're looking at in the, in the uh, data standards body of the account type, the cu customer descriptor, single person account, joint account, right? You'll need an opt-in for both parties in there and we know that there's examples right now in amongst the existing players who haven't got those boxes ticked yet in relation to access of accounts and transactions where it's a joint account and both have to opt in. And the third one, which is the one that most people look at, is the data elements that will be associated with that and the API standards that will enable the transfer and the access of the data to take place. And so that thing of, it's like, I think of it like a cube. There's a customer face, there's a account face, and the third face is the data elements. And when you get the blocks there, what we're trying to do is to identify for those initial account types the data that makes sense, given the use cases that still w none of us can imagine the, bre the breadth and, and uh, depth of those use cases will make sense, that then obviously work under the rules established by ACCC and the Information Commissioner to provide the r benefits to the consumer and the competitive uplifts that we're all talking about. So I think my approach is let's start simpler and then evolve from there because I don't think that websites and education programs are going to deliver in the time frame. I think some of the offers, and this is where, again, regulation comes in to make sure that some people aren't running too hard and too fast and too early uh, given that. But I, I, if, if you ask me personally, I, I'd run that risk to see where we get to and then I would try and rein back. I think we're out of time, uh, folks, so I just want to uh, uh, thank you all and f ask you to join me in thanking the panel for uh, this uh, last session at CEDA, State of the Nation. Thank you. Thank you.